Every day, scientists are learning more and more about how human brains work and how many of us don't fit into the old-fashioned understanding of how brains should work. But a lot of ideas about parenting and familial relationships still need to catch up to the reality of human variation. Neurological differences are natural, profoundly valuable parts of being in a community together and in being part of a family. Whoever you are, wherever you are in your journey, I am here to explore with you. We are all in this together. Welcome to Neurodiverging. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Neurodiverging Podcast. I'm your host, Danielle Sullivan, and I'm here today to talk to you about two models for understanding and managing fatigue that are popular in both neurodivergent and disability circles. The first is a spoon theory, and the second is fork theory. We're going to take a look at the ideas of each theory, as well as the benefits and limitations of each one. Both theories share a common purpose, which is to help folks with autism, chronic fatigue, and other conditions, which can impact a person's energy levels, make the most of the resources we have. And at the end of this, I have a free download for you to help manage your own energy, so keep on listening. If you would rather read than listen to this post, please go and check out neurodiverging.com where the transcript and all other information and show notes are. And if you find this podcast helpful, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Starting at just a dollar a month, you get special access to behind the scenes content, podcast after shows, coaching support, and other perks. Or you can pop onto PayPal or Ko-fi and shoot a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars my way. It really helps out the podcast and the website to keep us going for other folks to learn and gain from. So I appreciate your support and thank you to all my existing patrons as well. You know who you are. It is so appreciated. So before I go on further, I just want to say that this podcast is one of the very early podcasts that I put out, and it was very popular, which I very much appreciate. This is a re-recording of that original podcast to clear up some errors that were in the original and to make it a little bit more streamlined and easier to understand. So if you are a longtime listener, you may have heard this material before. There is no need to re-listen unless you would like to. If you're a new listener nothing to worry about. Just keep on going because this is new to you. So I hope uh, anyone who is going back and listening for the second time will appreciate the clearer content now that I've been podcasting a little longer and have a better sense of what we need to do to make this useful for you. So today we are talking about neurodivergent spoons and forks, autism and fatigue. Everyone has a different way of describing how they deal with fatigue, whether it's physical or emotional or mental. Many disabled and neurodivergent people have to ration their energy in a way that able-bodied, non-disabled people and neurotypical people do not. There are two primary models, there's lots of models, but two of the most common models of explaining fatigue and energy expenditure are the spoon theory and the fork theory. They were both created by disabled folks and distributed throughout their communities by word of mouth originally. These theories are applicable to the neurodivergent community, especially to autistics as well, and have been taken in by the autistic and neurodivergent communities and used in slightly different ways than they originally intended. So in this post, I'm going to give you an overview of both the spoon and the fork theories, talk about how they can apply to autism and neurodivergence, and which theory I like, because that's always the fun part. So one of the things I notice whenever I talk to people with a chronic illness, a disability, or a neurodivergence is how common fatigue is for people with one or more of those conditions. People may use different concepts or language to explain their fatigue, but fatigue itself is one of the underlying threads among people who are disabled, chronically ill, or and or neurodivergent. Most people with a disability or a chronic illness will notice a difference between the amount of energy that they can access at any given moment versus the amount of energy a neurotypical or non-disabled person can access. Similarly, a lot of us neurodivergent folks experience fluctuations in our energy levels that can make it even more challenging to keep up in a world built by and for neurotypical able-bodied people. Tasks that a neurotypical non-disabled person wouldn't find particularly draining, will use up a lot of energy for a disabled or neurodivergent person. 
in part because disabilities manifest differently for different folks, communities use different terminology to describe this energy cost phenomenon. The autistic community has a variety of helpful terms. The two that I think are particularly accessible, especially for people who may not have thought about it before or are new and kind of coming into this, are the spoon theory and the fork theory. Spoon theory predates fork theory by about eight years, as far as I can tell, and the fork theory builds on the spoon theory. They're somewhat complementary ideas that approach energy usage from different directions. I think that both can be very helpful depending on how your neuroatypicality or disability affects you. So we're gonna take a look at spoon theory first and build from there. Spoon theory was developed originally by Christine Miserandino in around 2010, and she initially wrote her story about the origins of spoon theory on her blog. Her blog is no longer available, but there is a PDF available of the original blog post that is sanctioned by Christine, and there are links to that and additional reading on my show notes page at Neurodiverging, so there should be a link in this podcast as well. So go check that out. I highly recommend checking out the post and there's also a video of the author reading the story at a conference if video is easier for you i really recommend going and checking it out because the story the blog post itself is two pages long so it doesn't take much time and it's worth so much but to sum it up in case you don't get there christine tells about a time that she was with a friend at a restaurant and she's trying to explain to them the struggle she has living with lupus she gave her friend a bunch of spoons to hold and explained that each spoon represented a concrete amount of energy that a disabled person might have once a spoon is used up doing a task it's gone and the person can't get it back so a person has to ration their spoons because they're only given so much Here's a quote from the blog. Christine says, most people start the day with an unlimited amount of possibilities and energy to do whatever they desire, especially young people. For the most part, they do not need to worry about the effects of their actions. So for my explanation, I use spoons to convey this point. I wanted something for my friend to actually hold, for me to then take away, since most people who get sick feel a loss of a life they once knew. If I was in control of taking away the spoons, then she would know what it feels like to have someone or something else in this case, lupus, being in control, end quote. For a person with a chronic disabling illness like lupus, this means that they wake up and they know they're only going to be able to do a given number of things during the day. And that number is likely to be much smaller than the number of things an able-bodied person can do in the same time period. Of course, a non-disabled person can be limited by available time, Um, unexpected events, unexpected short-term illness, like a cold or something, but they're not usually limited too much by access to energy on a day-to-day, typical day for them. So as we've heard, Christine used the original spoon theory to talk about lupus, but it was quickly adopted by the disability community at large, especially the chronic pain and chronic illness communities. It's not a leap, I don't think, to see that spoon theory applies to some neurodivergences as well, autism perhaps in particular. You're likely to find the spoon theory used frequently in autistic circles because the main points of the spoon theory adapt well to autistic circumstances. As an autistic person myself, I've noticed that we are used to the idea that we have to pour more energy into thinking about things that are simple for neurotypical people. So results that are simple for others take us much longer and are more difficult and use more energy than for other people because we have to do more processing of them. I've talked in other podcasts about my reliance on scripts as a shortcut for frequently used speech, which reduces the number of spoons I have to use for talking instead of spending my energy creating unique, spontaneous speech that isn't overall worth the energy expenditure. And there's plenty of other elements of autism that the spoon theory can help us explain. As autistic people, for example, we often rely on routines, safe environments, a special meal or same foods or two that we can reliably eat during a difficult sensory day. And time and space to recharge is something that we need as well. Spoon theory can also help us think through how autistic issues like meltdown, shutdown, sensory overload, and other overwhelms can affect our future energy levels. For example, if you don't sleep all one night, you'll wake up with fewer spoons the next day. Fewer spoons means you can't access as much energy and you're therefore more likely to accidentally stress yourself into a meltdown, leading to even fewer spoons the next day after that. For autistic people looking for a way to explain the very delicate balance of their energy expenditure to a neurotypical person or someone who uh, is not of the same neurotype as us, 
those people are used to waking up to a fresh new day every day, the same number of spoons every day, regardless of how they slept. So the spoon theory offers us a great way to explain the differences in our neurotypes to a neurotypical person. Now let's take a minute and I want to move on to the fork theory, which is supplemental to the spoon theory. Jen Rose, who lives with Ehlers-Donlos and several complications arising from it, first posted about the fork theory on their Tumblr account in 2018, where it then went viral. Jen Rose attributes this theory to their husband and subsequently wrote up a post on their personal blog about it. And the link to that original post is also in my show notes. So please go check that out. Jen Rose writes, quote, you know the phrase, stick a fork in me, I'm done, right? Well, fork theory is that one has a fork limit. That is, you can probably cope okay with one fork stuck in you, maybe two or three, but at some point you will lose it if one more fork happens. A fork could range from being hungry or having to pee to getting a new bill or a new diagnosis of illness. There are lots of different sizes of forks and volume versus quantity means that the fork limit is not absolute. I might be able to deal with 20 tiny little escargot fork annoyances, such as a hangnail or slightly suboptimal pants. That one I really understand, Jen Rose. But not even one large, you poked my trigger on purpose because you think it's fun to see me melt down pitchfork end quote. So Jen Rose here is pointing to the difference between having a bunch of tiny annoyances versus one huge energy sucker of an annoyance, right? The escargot forks versus the pitchfork. To continue the quote, Jen Rose then goes on to say, this is super relevant for neurodivergent folks. Like you might be able to deal with your feet being cold or a tag, but not both. Hubby describes the situation as, it may seem weird that I just get up and leave the conversation to go to the bathroom, but you just dumped a new financial burden on me and I already had to pee and going to the bathroom is the fork I can get rid of the fastest. End quote. So that is Jen Rose's explanation of the fork theory. Now, when I think about the spoon theory, I can't help but hearing it as, oh, whoops, you're out of spoons. That sucks. You'll just have to wait and be an exhausted, unhappy puddle on the floor until your next shipment of spoons comes in. And who knows when that will be? This framing seems to give me very little agency over my own life. I am sinking under this illness or condition, and I don't really get to do anything that could help. And I personally, and especially as a coach, really dislike that feeling. I think that there are many ways that we do not have power over our lives, but there is very rarely nothing you can do to take some of that control back. Of course, there are cases, especially with chronic illness and chronic pain, where this is absolutely true. You do have very little personal agency and you can't just fix something that's in your way. But with autism, and especially in my experience, a lot of our struggles are based in the reality that society isn't made with us in mind. It's not that we can't do things at all, it's that we can't do things in this specific social structure. What I love about the fork theory then is that while it's describing overwhelm and overload, it's more hopeful and optimistic than the spoon theory. The fork theory focuses on obstacles and then on the ways to remove them. The last pesky fork may trip you into all done, But that doesn't mean there's not some smaller fork you're still able to control, like putting on socks or changing your clothes to something with less of a tag or going to the bathroom. And then hopefully you can get rid of some of those small forks on your own and take back some control and some ability to handle the big pitchfork, like Jen Rose says. So the fork theory, in my opinion, allows for more agency for most folks, and I would argue it is particularly great for autistic people. Our overwhelms and overloads are usually a result of lots of those smaller forks stuck into us at one time, rather than one big pitchfork. Jen Rose, in their post, specifically calls out being hungry or cold or having to use the bathroom, an irritating clothing tag, and pants that don't fit exactly right as some of those forks. And I've definitely dealt with all those forks in my life, and I dare say you probably have too. The nice thing is, if you can manage to notice those forks, which is, I admit, tricky and takes practice for an autistic brain, for an autistic brain, you can have a chance of addressing them. Removing even one small fork can solve your overwhelm in one fell swoop on a lucky day. And that means something. That can be a lot. There are plenty of other things that can act as forks for autistic people, like the lights being too bright, weird smells in the room, someone breathing too loudly, too many fans on, whatever it is, sensory overwhelms, right? We have adaptations such as headphones to reduce noise, uh, turning off the lights, moving to another environment that's quieter, having routines that are built for our comfort and our well-being, having scripts like I've talked about before. 
All of these adaptations remove forks from our lives and decrease the likelihood that we're going to have sensory overload or overwhelm or meltdown. So a lot of us are already controlling for some of the forks in our life. And knowing that that's what you're doing and conceptualizing it in terms of the spoon and fork theory allows you to have even greater control of what you're doing for yourself and taking care of yourself. So I've already said that I love the fork theory and the sense of agency its perspective offers, but neither the fork theory or the spoon theory are saying, hey, autistic person, you can control everything in your life all the time and make everything perfect, because that's just not possible. Thinking about what my problem is through the lens of the spoon theory has helped me to improve my circumstances drastically many times. However, at the end of the day, the spoon theory feels more limited and limiting to me. All the spoons available to me are the same size. There are no serving spoons, teaspoons, or long-handled jelly spoons. The lack of variation makes it seem as if everything, no matter whether it's getting out of bed or brushing my teeth or going to the grocery store or going to the mall to get pants, it takes the exact same amount of effort. Then once all the spoons and energy are gone, there's no way to regain it, right? That's spoon theory. Now with the fork theory, it seems more about balancing and achieving a state of equilibrium. I'm getting rid of all the tiny forks as fast as I can, which makes it just that little bit more possible to deal with the larger forks. There might still be a giant pitchfork that I can't remove, which sucks and is awful, and I can lose a lot of my energy to it. But I do still have some agency over the little forks and their causes. The fork theory gives us a way to get in front of some of the obstacles, help ourselves out a bit more, and maybe save some of our energy for when the pitchforks appear. So while I think that the fork theory improves upon the spoon theory and works better for me, both models are incredibly important to the disability, chronic fatigue, chronic illness, and autistic communities. The two models together show different aspects of energy usage and how we are able to access and address our own well-being. And that's the spoon theory and the fork theory in a nutshell. I hope this gives you some things to think about when you're considering how to maximize your own energy availability and to make your environment suit you as best you can. As always, if you have questions, comments, send me an email at neurodiverging.podcast at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. Now, to thank you for making it to the end, I just want to mention that I know that it can be difficult to identify all those little forks. And in my experience, autistic folks have a lot more trouble than neurotypical folks telling when we're feeling hot or cold or itchy or hungry or thirsty or tired. And I know I certainly did and still do sometimes. So about two years ago, I made myself a checklist and I use it whenever I recognize that I'm having a problem and I can't specifically identify it. I can look at my checklist and say, hey, are any of these things occurring right now? If so, what's the intervention to address them? So my whole family now uses this checklist and I use it with my kids and my partner to help us figure out what we're feeling and how we can help ourselves remove a fork, quote unquote, or feel better. So I hope this checklist will help you too. And what you can do is you can go to my website at neurodiverging.com. The link is below and you can sign up for the Getting Unstuck checklist on my mailing list and get it for free. There's no cost, just get it for free for joining the mailing list. And then you'll also be signed up to my mailing list. I send out a mailer like twice a month, which has new podcast episodes, news and new blog posts and other helpful things. So I really encourage you to go do that if it seems like it would be helpful to you. Thank you again to my patrons for supporting this episode of Neurodiverging. And for all of you for listening, please go, if you would like, to neurodivergent.com to sign up for the checklist. If you found this useful and you want more content like this, this is the kind of content that goes to the patrons only at my Patreon. So starting at just a dollar a month, you get all that access. So go check that out at patreon.com slash neurodiverging. Thank you for being here. And remember, we are all in this together.